In the descriptive statistics and visualization video lesson, we briefly introduced an experiment on sleep disorders. It was an example where a scientist administered a new formula of sleeping medication to 35 test subjects and recorded how many of them slept continuously for eight hours. And this, this experiment was replicated 15 times and it produced a data set. So that data set uh, it was a list of 15 numbers representing the number of subjects out of each group of 35 who managed to sleep at least eight hours in a given night uh, after uh, trying this new medication. We began with a few examples where we calculated the, you know, the mean and the median more or less by hand uh, by following the, their, their definitions. And as far as that went, that was fine. That was a good way to get started calculating some descriptive statistics. However, we didn't continue that example throughout the video lesson for the other descriptive statistics. Um, and when it came to displaying some of the visualizations, like our histogram of our data or our box and whisker plot, we, we simply just displayed it. Uh, we didn't go through the steps of using technology or anything to uh, produce those, those, those graphs. So the point of this video is to go through those steps now, to use some technology to carefully compute descriptive statistics and construct visualizations for that data set. And then a little bit later on in this tutorial, we'll do the same thing using MATLAB. And so in order to do these operations on the data set, we need to first enter it into the calculator's memory we need to store it in a list. And so to do that, we'll access the list editor because, oops, I didn't want to do that. We'll access the list editor by clicking stat edit. It brings us this spreadsheet-esque interface for the calculator. And really the only reason we're doing this is because our data set is pretty short. There's only 15 numbers in it. And those numbers are, if you remember from the example, 11, 9, 10, 12, 9, 15, 10, 7, 15, already messed up, so I'm going to go back and enter these incorrectly. So I'm just going to overwrite my entries so far. 11, 9, 10, 12, 9, 15, 10, and 7. Then the rest of my numbers are 13, 16, and 10. So mistakes happen like that sometimes. 4, 7, 9, and 11. All right, and there's my 15 data points. And so my first order of business is to get as many of my descriptive statistics for this data set as I possibly can. These are going to include things like measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and mode, some measures of variability like the range, the standard deviation, the variance, the, the interquartile range, um, measures of symmetry like skewness or Bowley's measure of symmetry or um, measures of the importance of outliers like the kurtosis. I'd like to be able to calculate all of those, and there are a lot to calculate. We're going to follow a strategy that's going to, you can think of it as, as three steps. First thing that we're going to do, the first step, is that the calculator has a built-in um, menu entry, a built-in command that we can apply to a data set, and that command is called one variable stats, or one var stats. And it will compute many, not all, but many of the descriptive statistics that we want, and it will store them all in memory under their own variable names. So the way we access that is we click on the stat button, arrow over to calc, and then there's one var stats right there at the top. We'll select that. And now we need to apply that to the correct list, and that's going to be the list that contains our data. Now, yours might already be on the correct list by default, but my data is in L1, and right now this calculator looks like it's about to apply one bar stats to L2. So I want to change that, and I'll change that by clicking on second one to get L1. And I'm going to enter through everything else until I get to calculate, and I just left frequency list 
blank because I don't need it for this operation. All right, and so the output of this is that it gives me a summary uh, table of all of the one variable statistics that it has calculated. So the first entry, x bar, is the mean, 10.2, which if you remember from the example, that's the correct value. And there's a couple of single variable statistics that we don't really need to use for our purposes. First one, sigma x, is the sum of all the data points, 153. We're just not going to use it. And sigma x squared is 1693. It's the sum of the squares of the data points. Again, we're not going to use it. The next two entries, s sub x and sigma sub x, are both examples of standard deviations. But only one of them is correct in the sense of the formula that we're currently using, and that's sigma sub x. The other one, s sub x, is an example of an unbiased standard deviation, and we will use that later on. We just don't need it right now. So the correct standard deviation in the calculator menu for the time being is sigma sub x. And you can see it's a value of 2.97 and so on. N represents the number of data points in the data set. So that's correct. There's 15 of them. Min x is the minimum value of the, in the data set, which was 4. Then if I scroll down a little bit we'll, to the end, we'll see that we've got q1 mean and q3, or q1 median and q3. Those are the three quartiles, because we remember that Q2, the second quartile, is no different than the median. So we can see that this has picked up both the quartiles and the median for us, and they are the correct values, 9, 10, and 12. And then finally, max x is 16. In a little bit, I'll show you how we can access the data in these variables in order to perform calculations on it uh, from the, the main input command line on the calculator. Uh, but for now, it's, it's pretty good just to be able to see them all in summary form like this. So we need to take stock of what we've got and what we're missing. And so what we're missing is the variance. We don't have that. We don't have the mode, the most frequently occurring data points. And we don't have the skewness, Bowley's measure of skewness, and we don't have the... Um, the, the uh, kurtosis. All right, so to get those, we've got really two more steps in our overarching strategy that we're going to follow. Many of those descriptive statistics are things that we can calculate just really in one step with a formula at the command line if we can access the data that of the descriptive statistics that have been computed. Um, and so basically all of the remaining descriptive statistics that we don't have, we can compute using a formula at the screen, at the um, command line for the screen, except for skewness and kurtosis. Those two are going to be a little bit more complicated. Before we do that, though, it's probably worth doing something that works sometime reasonably well for computing the mode, because that's one of our missing descriptive descriptive statistics. And we know that the mode isn't really something that we compute using a formula. We just have to go through our data set and figure out which value occurs the most frequently. And that gets marginally easier to do, especially for small data sets like this one, if we sort our data. And so I probably should have done that in the first place. I'll do it now though. So I'm going to go sort the data by going to edit and then sort A going to tell it that I want to sort my L1 column of my data, my first list, and it's just going to say done. But if I go back and edit the list, we'll see that my data is now sorted. And as I scroll down this L1 column, I can see that most of the entries only appear one or two times, but 9 and 10 both appear three times. And so they both tie for being the most frequently occurring values in this data set. And that tells us that our mode um, it really takes on two values, both 9 and 10. Now, one pitfall to be aware of with this TI calculator, if you ever do anything to edit a list, modify a list, and we just did by sorting it into a new order, that's going to clear all of the values out of the one variable statistics menu. So if I quit out of this and 
um, what I need to do is rerun one variable statistics. So I'm going to click on stat, calc, one variable stats, and leave it applied to L1. Enter that. And then that brings us back and we see that we've still got access to those values. If I hadn't done that, the step that I'm about to do next to compute things like the variance and the range and the interquartile range and even Bowley's measure of skewness, um, it wouldn't have worked because these values would have been wiped from the calculator's memory. But they're there now and I can access them for any number of calculations. So I'm going to quit out of this screen and hit the main command line. I, I want to calculate, let's say, the, the variance. Well, to do that, I need to remember the formula for the variance, and that is the square of the standard deviation. And I know that the standard deviation is one of the variables stored in the calculator's memory, sigma sub x. So I just need to be able to access it so that I can square it. And the way to do that is to click on the VARS menu, scroll down in this case to statistics, and then in that menu scroll down to sigma sub x, the one that I want. And I want to square it. So I use the power button, supply a 2 in order to square it, and my variance becomes 8.82, 6 repeating. Well, what about some of the other descriptive statistics that um, aren't skewness and aren't kurtosis? Well, maybe I'd like to get the range. Well, to do that, I'll need to go and get the maximum value and subtract the minimum value from it. So I'll go to the variables menu, scroll down to statistics. I just need to select max x, minus, go back to the vars menu, scroll down to statistics, find min x. So max x minus min x is the range and it's 12. All right, well, what else could I calculate? One um, other measure of variability, the robust me measure of variability, was the interquartile range. That was the third quartile minus the first quartile. So I'm going to go to VARS, statistics. Those quartiles don't appear in the XY menu, but they do appear in the points menu. So I need to select Q3 for the third quartile, minus VARS statistics, scroll over to points, get down to Q1. So Q3 minus Q1, the interquartile range is just 3. All right, now what? What else is missing? Well, we need skewness, we need kurtosis, but those were the two that I said I didn't want to compute um, at the command line because they're actually a little bit more complex. But I can calculate Bowley's measures of, measure of Q, uh, if I can say it, I can calculate it. Bowley's measure of Q, skewness. All right, and so this was Q3 plus Q1 minus two Q2, all quantity over the interquartile range. So that's just a long formula that I need to enter carefully with, ca with um, parentheses. So that's going to be Q3. So variables, statistics, let's try that in here. Variables, statistics, enter, points down to Q3. plus Q1, so variables, statistics, points, Q1, minus 2 times Q2. Remember, Q2 is the median, so variables, statistics, points median divided by 
Now the simplest thing to do would be just to realize that I've calculated the interquartile range for the denominator already, Q3 minus Q1, which is three. So I could just type three in right now. That would probably be the simplest. But if for some reason I hadn't done that, um, I could just enter in the formula here too. I could do variables, statistics, points, but wrong one. So I'm gonna overwrite that X1 variables, statistics, points, Q3 minus, and I need Q1, so I'll go back to variables, statistics, points, Q1. So Q3 minus Q1 becomes my denominator. And so you get an interquartile range of 0 0.333358. All right, the only remaining statistics for us to calculate at this point are the skewness and the kurkosis. And we'd like to be able to calculate those, but their formula is quite a bit more complicated, right? The, these formulas make use of every data point, and we don't really want to compute them as, um, you know, a formula that we input from the command line here. It would be simpler if I could operate on my entire data set in order to compute them. Because remember, the, the skewness is the mean of the cube, the mean of the cubes of the deviations of each data point from the mean of the data set, all divided by the cube of the standard deviation for the data set. Well, I can compute that, but it's going to be better if I compute it by going back to my list, get access to L1. So what I can do here is that I can go start a new column and form the cubes of the deviation of each of these data points from the mean of the data points in the L1 column. And not only that, I can take that calculation and divide it by the standard deviation of the L1 column. That's going to give me a bunch of numbers in L2, and then if I just compute their mean, that will be equivalent to computing the skewness. So there's a few steps to it, but once you, know, you get the hang of it, it's, it's not that hard to do. So what I need to do is make sure that my cursor in the L2 column is at the header so that the command line should just say L2 is equal to something rather than L2 of 1 or L2 of 2 or one of the other individual entries is equal to something. And that something is going to become the formula that I just described. So I want to find the cube of the differences of the L1 column minus its mean. So I just do that. I'm going to say in parentheses L1 minus the mean of L1. Remember, the mean of L1 is stored in the VARS statistics menu at the moment. And then I can cube it. And then I can divide that whole thing by the standard deviation cubed. And that gives me a bunch of entries in L2. Now, none of those are the skewness, but if I were to calculate their mean, that would give me the skewness of the L1 data set. Now, I, I still want to calculate the kurtosis before I go through and form the mean of the L2 column in order to get the skewness. Um, it's just going to be a better workflow of the way these calculators work. And so to do that, I need to remember the kurtosis formula. And the kurtosis is the mean of the fourth power of the deviation of our data set in L1 from its mean, all divided by the fourth power of the standard deviation of our data set in L1. And so I'm going to enter all of that into the L3 column header 
except for the part of calculating the mean. So L3 is equal to the deviation of L1 from its mean, and I can find the mean in the VARS statistics menu, second entry. Right. I want to raise that to the fourth power. Then I want to divide that by the standard deviation, which I can find in VAR statistics. And I want that standard deviation to be raised to the fourth power. All right, when I calculate that, my L3 column is going to be the numbers that, if I find their mean, it will give me the kurtosis. So in summary, the mean of the L2 column is going to give me the skewness. The mean of the L3 column is going to give me the kurtosis. The way I can get that mean is just to apply one variable stats to both L2 and L3 a little bit later on. So I'm going to go to, I'll just quit. I'll go to stat, calc, one variable statistics, and I want to apply that to L2 instead of L1 get the skewness. And there it tells me that the mean is 0 0.0647 or 06467 and so on. That's the skewness of my data set. But what about the kurtosis? I need the mean of the third column, the mean of the L3 column. So now I'll just go and say, well, stat, calc, one variable statistics, apply that to L3 instead of L2. And the mean that I get from that is 2.934 and so on. So that is the kurtosis of my data in the L1 column. Right. So that's a process to get all of the descriptive statistics with the calculator and it's actually not my preferred process, but if the only tool that you've got at your disposal is the calculator, this tutorial demonstrates that it's possible. It just probably takes a little bit of practice to get the level of comfort where you can you know, perform these steps repeatedly. Now, before we move on to what is my preferred method, which is really just to use mathematical software such as MATLAB, we'll create some visualizations of our data set. The way we'll do that is we're going to click on second stat plot and I'm going to do this all at once. I'm going to put a box and whisker plot and a histogram on the same set of axes so I can get all of the summary statistics aggregated into two visualizations at once. So by going into the stat plot menu, it gives me the option to turn various plots on or off. Now I want to turn plot one on. Now, so it's on. I'm going to scroll down to type and I want to select this little icon that looks like a bar graph in order to create a histogram. So I'm going to hit that. And then X list. Well, that's going to be the data that I'm trying to come up with my histogram of, and that should be L1. If it's not L1 on yours, you need to change it to that. We're going to leave frequency alone. We'll set it at 1. If you've got a color to set, you know, go ahead and knock yourself out and set it. That it gives us everything we need to create the basic plot. But now what I want to do is click on the window button to customize it. Now, I want to set the maximum and the minimum values of my plot window, both in the x direction and the y direction, to values that make sense for my data. Now, I know that my data, at worst, could range from 0 to 35 because each data point represents the number of test subjects out of 35 who got a solid eight hours uh, worth of sleep in a given night. And so I'm going to use that range. X min is going to be zero. Scroll down to X max and set that to 35. I'm going to set X scale to, or in my case, leave it to one. 
So it's going to give me a, basically a width of histogram bars are going to be equal to one. And then I need to scale the vertical range of my plot. So right now it's going from a y min of zero to one. Um, I remember that the y-axis on a histogram is going to represent the number of times a particular data point appeared in the data set. And I know from previous analysis of this data set that the numbers 9 and 10, the modes, appeared three times each. So y-max ought to be at least three. Uh, I'm going to set it to four. And then y-scale I'll leave as one. y-resolution I'll leave as one. The rest of this stuff I'm just going to leave alone. So now I'm going to return to stat plots by clicking second stat plot. For the moment, I want all remaining plots to be set to off. So I'm going to go to plot two and select it, turn it off. Now I'm going to go back and trace my graph. And I can see that I've got a histogram. If I scroll around with my arrows, it will move a cursor to the top of each bin in the histogram, and down here n equals 2 tells me the height of those bars. So I can you know, study my histogram, and there it is. Now I'd like to add a box and whisker plot to this graph, and so now I'm going to go back to stat plot, and I'm going to create it on this graph by choosing plot 2 to be on. So I'm going to hit plot 2, I'm going to set it to be on, but I'm going to go down and change the type to a box and whisker plot. And there's two types. I'm going to choose the second one. All right. The rest of these values I'm going to leave alone. Um, and that's pretty much going to be it. So now we're going to go back and click on trace. We can see that we've got both the whisker plot and the histogram kind of superimposed on each other. This doesn't look quite as good because they're laying right on top of each other. I believe I can modify this by going back to the window and just choose a little bit higher of a Y max, maybe six, to give myself enough room to fit both graphs in. So let's try to trace now, and yeah, it looks better. We can see both the histogram and the box and whisker plot. So it's certainly possible to get a quick rendering of a histogram and a box and whisker plot using the TI calculator. We've already seen how we could use the TI84 plus calculator to compute descriptive statistics and then later on produce graphs uh, that summarize the behavior of, of, of a data set. And these graphs include things like histograms and box and whisker plots. We're going to accomplish those same goals uh, but we're going to use, in this case, MATLAB. And so what we're looking at now is a MATLAB live script that will go through and compute all of the same descriptive statistics of the same data set and then uh, the same types of visualizations. So remember the example that we've been working through uh, imagined that we had conducted a experiment on sleep disorders by rounding up 15 groups of 35 people each administering uh, experimental sleep medication to each group, and then counting up the number of people within each group who managed to sleep a solid eight hours or more each night. And so our data set represents those tallies of people who got sufficient sleep. First order of business then is to get that data into MATLAB, and we're going to do that by storing it into a MATLAB array. Um, so arrays in MATLAB are square brackets, in this case, it's a row vector, so it's numbers separated by spaces, although I could have separated them by column, uh, commas as well. Uh, and then I've taken that array and stored it in a variable called D. So if I want to run that first line, we see that that value of D gets stored in memory, um, and it just contains the list of, of values that belong to our data set. Now I'd like to start computing some of the descriptive statistics, and I'll begin with the measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. MATLAB just simply has functions called mean, median, and mode, all lower cases, uh, to, um, that I would feed 
that I'd feed my data set to, that I'd feed my variable D to, and it will just compute those descriptive statistics for me. In this case, I'm storing the results in variables also called mean, median, and mode, but since MATLAB is case sensitive and since I've capitalized those, those are treated differently than the function names mean, median, and mode. So I'll step through those three, um, three commands and we see that they've created mean, median, and mode and uh, stored the appropriate results in them. And those values agree for the most part with what we saw on our calculator except there's one discrepancy with the mode. The mode just tells us 9. It did not pick up the second mode of 10 that we saw on the calculator. When MATLAB computes a mode, if there are more than one mode value, or if there is more than one mode value for a data set, MATLAB will just pick up the smallest value. Then we move on to some measures of variability. And these are going to start with the variance and the standard deviation. MATLAB has built-in functions for those as well, var and std. They're almost as simple as mean, median, and mode, but in order to calculate the variance and the standard deviation um, form that we've been using, we've got to supply an optional argument of 1 right after the data set itself. And that just ensures that we are computing the variance and the standard deviation in its simple biased form. And this is going to replicate the values that the TI was, was computing using the uh, sigma sub x and sigma, sigma sub x squared entries in the variables menu. All right, so if I run those, I get the same values that we saw in the calculator. Other measures of variability that might be of interest to us include the range and the interquartile range, but in order to get the interquartile range, I need to get the quartiles themselves. Um, the range we just compute using the difference by finding the difference uh, between the max and the min of the data set, and MATLAB has a built in max and min function, and so I'm just computing the range using them. Quartiles take a little bit of thought um, because MATLAB has some additional flexibility. MATLAB isn't just capable of calculating quartiles, it can calculate any quantile. So um, that would include things like percentiles or other subdivisions of a data set. And what I mean by that is that if we remember that a quartile or the three quartiles just mark the points in the data set once it's sorted, that are a quarter of the way, a half of the way, and three quarters of the way through the data set, you know, percentiles would just be um, um, one one hundredth, two one hundredths, three one hundredths, and so forth of the way through. Uh, deciles are one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, and so on of the way through the uh, data set. So we can tell MATLAB to compute any of those generalized quantiles by telling it the data, telling the quantile function the data that we want to compute quantiles of, so d, our, our variable, and then the fractional way through the data set that we want those quantiles to be at. So if my quartiles are a quarter a half and three quarters of the way through the data set, I just need to specify those values, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75. So if I step through and run that, my quantiles are 9, 10, and 11.75, according to MATLAB. There is a little bit of a discrepancy there. The calculator told us that the third quartile was 12 rather than 11.75. That's just there because MATLAB uses a technique called linear interpolation to compute its uh, the quartiles of a data set or any quantile of a data set. And that just prevents it from having to do a lot of sorting and searching through the data, which is kind of slow and inefficient. So it's, um, it's a different way of uh, computing a different measure. The answers are slightly different, but it's okay. We just have to be clear that we are taking a different approach. Once we've got the quartiles, I can calculate the interquartile range. Since I've stored the quartiles in a vector called Q, which contains the three values, 
the interquartile range is just the difference between the third quartile and the first, which I indicate with Q parentheses three minus Q parentheses one. So if I run that, it's going to calculate 11.75 minus nine, which is 2.75. Now I'd like to calculate some measures of asymmetry, skewness and later on Bally's measure of skewness. Well, MATLAB has a built-in skewness function and I can just pl plug the data directly into it. And that gives me 0 0.0647, which was the same value that we saw in the ca um, calculator. And then Bowley's measure, we just have to enter in uh, the formula, which is based on the three quartiles. So remember, Bowley's measure is third quartile plus the first minus two times the median all over the interquartile range. So if I compute that, I get a value that's a little different from what we had on the calculator. Again, that's because Bowley's measure depends on the third quartile, and my result for the third quartile is a little bit different. Lastly, the last uh, measure of, of um, well, the last descriptive statistic that I want is the kurtosis, which measures the importance of the outliers. Uh, MATLAB has a built-in kurtosis function. So I run it, we get a kurtosis of 2.934, and that was consistent with what we saw on the calculator. Well, on the calculator, we plotted some histograms and box and whisker plots. I'd like to be able to do that here. For histograms, the, um, the main thing that I need is to know how to use the histogram function. So since I'm doing graphics, I'm actually going to do three different graphs in this, this um, live script. I am going to store the output of each one in a different figure window in MATLAB. And that's accomplished with figure one, figure two, and then figure three. So as I said, to produce a histogram, we need to know how the histogram function works. And I really have to supply two things to make any good sense of the histogram function. I need to tell the function that the data that I want to find the histogram of, that's D, then I also need to give it a array of the locations of the edges, the left and right edges for each of the bins. And what I do is maybe a little bit different from what some people do, but I like my bins for the histogram to be centered right over the central um, integer numerical value that that bin represents. So if the first bin represents the number of zeros in my data set, I want that bin to be centered over the value of zero on the x-axis. So that means that if the bin is going to have a width of one, its left edge should be at negative one half, its right edge should be at positive one half. And that pattern is going to continue for all of the bins. So I need to supply a bunch of, if I realize that my, my um, data can range from zero to 35 for this data set, then I want my edges to range from negative one-half up to 35 and a half in increments of one. And that's what this notation does. It creates an array of values starting at negative one-half, going up to 35 and a half in increments of one. So if I step through the figure command and the histogram command, it already produces a graph of you know, the histogram. And we'll We'll zoom in on that and look at it in a little bit more detail in a minute, but it's, it's already there. The rest of what is in this block of code, though, we'll run it before we blow up and examine the histogram. Uh, th those are just formatting considerations. So I'm going to specify an X ticks command. It's going to, in this case, I want to put a numerical label under every other bin starting at bin 0 going up to bin 35. So I'm going to put an X tick under 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way up to really 34. And that's, that's what this X ticks command here does. If I wanted to skip every fifth uh, bin, I'd do 0, colon 5, comma 35, or every tenth, I'd go 0, colon 10, comma 35. And I just do that so that I can get labels under enough of my bins that I can see what's going on without having the numerical values overlapping each other, making it impossible to read. Grid on, although you're not going to be able to see it very well until I blow it up, puts a uh, graph paper grid uh, behind the histogram bars. And then X label and Y label just write a uh, descriptive 
text under the x-axis and y-axis respectively. So if I run them, we see the labels up here. So if I want to see what that histogram actually looks like, I'll open it up in a bigger figure window. Maybe I'll even blow that figure window up a little bit so it shows up on your screen. We can see it's a histogram that's pretty similar to the one that we had on the calculator. It's just formatted a little bit differently and labeled for one. This is a nice feature uh, to have these, these figure windows in MATLAB because if I wanted to put this, this figure into a publication, all I'd have to do is go to the file menu, say save as, and then pick a format that's suitable for whatever I'm writing in. You know, maybe I want to use a PNG or some other bitmap format if I'm working in Word or encapsulated PostScript or PDF if I'm working in some professional typesetting software like LaTeX or, or um, any of the other suites that are out there. And then I would just supply a file name with that, that output and save it in whatever directory I wanted. All right, well, there's two more blocks of code for two other visualizations. The next one is just another vi uh, visualization of a histogram. It's going to be very similar to the first histogram. The only difference is that instead of having bar heights that represent the absolute frequencies of each data point relative to the bin, I'm going to make the bars scaled to the bar height scaled to represent the relative frequencies or the probabilities that are being estimated for each data point that I might observe in the data set. What that means operationally is that if I took the frequency counts for each value in my data set and divided by the total number of values in my data set, which is 15, that gives me the relative frequencies for each of those data points. So the only thing that really has to change is that I have to supply this optional uh, setting and value pair to the histogram command. It says I, rather than having the default normalization, which is a relative frequency, or uh, absolute frequency, I want to use the PDF normalization, which effectively gives me the, um, the uh, relative frequency, the, effectively the probability. So that's all I really had to change, although I also changed the Y label to reflect that that's what I was doing. If you compare this code to this code, everything else is essentially the same. So I'll just step through it, and we'll see that we gradually get a new histogram. If I blow that histogram up so that you can see it, you see now that the relative frequency axis is scaled as a probability rather than uh, absolute frequency. And it's also labeled as the relative frequency rather than absolute frequency. Last thing that we want to reproduce with MATLAB is the box and whisker plot of our data set. And all we need to do is throw the box plot command at our data. And so if I step through, create a new figure window, stick the box plot of the data set in it, and then give it a descriptive title that says what we're doing, and blow up the window so that you can see it, you get a box and whisker plot thing to keep in mind about this one is that MATLAB does detect outliers. So these are the probable minimum and maximum values here, um, rather than the actual minimum and maximum values of the data set. Those are the red X's here. Everything else, first, second, third um, quartiles, um, and we can see these tooltips are actually coming up and telling me um, what those values are. So there's our box and whisker plot. All right, and that is pretty much the end of how we would use MATLAB to uh, compute these descriptive statistics and then visualize our data using histograms and box and whisker plots. I prefer this approach over the calculator, but again, if, if the calculator is all that you have, it still gets the job done. Uh, it's just sometimes it's a little bit harder to get the results into a publication if you're writing about your work.